His name is Philemon. Philemon. I have to admit, over the years, I've heard that name pronounced in many ways. The experts tell me that this New Testament name is pronounced Philemon. I've also heard preachers and teachers pronounce it Philemon or even Philemon. In fact, one Sunday I preached about the letter to Philemon, and throughout the sermon I mispronounced the name and I kept saying Philemon. And after church, a little boy told me he was very excited that I had preached about his favorite game. And I said, no, I was preaching about Philemon. And he said, no, my favorite game, it's called Pokemon. <laughs> he thought I was preaching about Pokemon, but it's Philemon. And today's New Testament passage tells us that Philemon has a problem. St. Paul's letter to Philemon is the shortest book in the Bible. It only has 25 verses. In this short letter, Paul gently but powerfully informs Philemon that Philemon has a problem, and so do we. What's the problem? Well, it's this. If we take Jesus seriously, we will see that Jesus is at work changing the world and Jesus wants us to participate in changing the world. Doing that is going to be very hard because changing the world begins with accepting the reality that first and foremost, the Lord is going to change us and change our assumptions and change everything we thought we could take for granted in this world. A little background. Paul writes this letter right around the year 60 or so. He's in prison for the crime of preaching about Jesus, Jesus who died and is risen. Paul has a friend named Pokemon. Ah, there I go again, Philemon. And Paul probably baptized Philemon. So, in a sense, Philemon owes his faith and his hope for eternal life to Paul. Like many people at that time, Philemon owned slaves. And one of his slaves, named Onesimus, escaped and found his way to Paul. And what does Paul do with this runaway slave? Well, he preaches to him and baptizes Onesimus, the slave. A bit later, Paul writes this brief letter to his friend Philemon. And Paul says, I am sending Onesimus, your slave, back to you. Paul says, I'm sending him back to you, not as a slave, but more than that. I'm sending him back to you as a beloved brother in Christ. And Paul concludes, So welcome, Onesimus, as you would welcome me. Are you beginning to see Philemon's problem? Philemon and Onesimus, the slave owner, the slave, now they are both baptized brothers in Christ. They worship the same God. They receive the same Holy Spirit. They're nourished by the same Eucharist. In many subtle and not so subtle ways, Paul invites Philemon to understand this point, that once Jesus comes into the equation, everything else changes. Paul's message to Philemon is clear. If you take Jesus seriously, you have to change the way you treat people, even this runaway slave. Jesus, through St. Paul, has created a problem for Philemon. How? Well, the whole economic structure of the ancient Roman world and the world surrounding the Mediterranean, well, it was built upon slavery. 
Almost everybody's livelihood depended on slavery one way or another. Well, Jesus turns this system upside down. Because once a slave and a slave owner become brothers in Christ, everything changes. Everything has to change. What was it Paul said? Welcome him as you would welcome me. Treat him as you would treat me. Life was easier before this troublemaking Jesus came along. As I drive around Richmond, Virginia, where I live, I occasionally pass churches with those fancy big electronic signs in front. You know those signs in front of churches, and they often have sayings on them. Sayings like, do you have questions? Jesus has answers. Or the sign might say, are you struggling? Jesus will lift your burden. From these signs, you could get the impression that Jesus has come to fix our problems. But then along comes the message of Paul to Philemon, and you realize maybe, maybe the New Testament is causing us problems. Along comes Jesus in this week's gospel reading, too. And he says, now listen to what Jesus says in the gospel. You can't follow me unless you hate your father and your mother, your spouse and your children and your whole life. Oh, and you have to renounce all your possessions. Imagine what would happen if I put a big electronic sign out in front of St. Mary's Church announcing if you want to join St. Mary's, you must hate your parents, your spouse, and your kids, and give us all your money. I wonder what would happen to attendance. Now, when Jesus says in our translation that we have to hate our families, we might be hitting a bit of a translation issue. According to the experts, uh, the Greek words that Jesus uses can mean you have to love me first, love me fully, and then all your other loves flow from that first love. Some scholars say that the Greek words here are about our relationship priorities, that we must love Christ first, that he is our top priority, and then every other love in our life flows from that. Our love for Jesus, therefore, has to shape our love for everybody else. And that will change how we treat our parents, our spouse, our children. It may, at times, create conflicts. It will require that we change how we treat our families, our neighbors, our slaves, even our enemies not sure that Jesus is here just to fix all our problems. It seems to me that Jesus is creating new problems for us. In Luke's gospel, Jesus' disciples quickly came to understand that once you begin to take Jesus seriously, he's going to keep causing you problems. And Philemon quickly discovered that once he took Jesus seriously, his whole life, in fact, his whole economic and social world is getting turned around because now his slave is his brother. So if you go to church hoping that Jesus will fix your problems, you may not be paying attention. Each week the gospel should create a new problem for you. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I am a flawed human being. And as a flawed human being, I have to tell you that there are occasionally members of my congregation who, every time I see them, they just seem to get on my last nerve. Well, if it weren't for Jesus, that would not be a problem. You see, if I were not a Christian, and then I meet somebody I don't like, well, I can just ignore them. I can dismiss them, I can brush them aside, or to use our modern term, I could just cancel them. But Jesus has created a problem for me 
that parishioner who gets on my nerves, he's a brother in Christ. She's a sister in Christ. And I have to treat them the way that I would treat Christ. Hmm. How easy life would be if I could just dismiss the people I would want to dismiss. Lots of folks do that in our cancel culture these days. But Jesus has created a problem. He demands that I treat you the way that I would treat Jesus. That takes work. When we fail to do what Jesus demands, the world gets fractured. For instance, over 400 years ago, the first Africans came to the New World. They arrived on the ironically named Point Comfort, which we now call Hampton, Virginia. They came to the New World as slaves. Think how different our nation's history would be if, from the very beginning, 400 years ago, somebody had allowed Jesus to give them a problem. If they had stood up 400 years ago and said, we, we can't treat them as slaves. We must treat them as brothers and sisters in Christ. We still wrestle with the horrible repercussions of our failure to do what scripture demands. After the Civil War, slavery officially ended, but some people in some states became creative in finding new ways to subjugate African Americans. We call them the, the Jim Crow laws. Where were the voices demanding that we treat African Americans like sisters and brothers in Christ? When Irish immigrants came to this country in waves, they faced violent persecution in the cities of the Northeast. When Italians and Poles came here, they faced racial and cultural hatreds. And today, human trafficking continues. Young people are seized and their lives are stolen from them. Doesn't Christ want us to have a problem with that? Isn't Christ demanding that we treat the children in the womb the way that we would treat Christ? Isn't Christ demanding that we treat children at the, at the border the way that we would treat Christ? Isn't Christ demanding that we treat the prisoner on death row, the hungry veteran down the street, the family member with dementia, the lonely neighbor, the way that we would treat Christ? If we take him seriously, Jesus and his gospel will create new problems for us every time we dare to listen. And he creates new opportunities for us to be strengthened to do this gospel work every time we gather in a community of brothers and sisters who can inspire us to stay faithful. In our church family, we encounter the community where we are nourished for his work through our sharing in the body and blood of Christ, Christ, whom we should love first and best. Years ago, a visitor to India saw Mother Teresa cleaning the wounds of a person who was dying of leprosy. The visitor saw this and felt sick to his stomach, and he said to Mother Teresa in his Texas accent, Darling, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa replied, Neither would I, but I'd gladly do it for Christ. <laughs>